Let's get a drink some water here. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> That's Aaron drinking water. <laughs> All right, and we're recording. Hey, Aaron, what's going on? Hey, how you doing, Luis? So you're not in California. You're in New York. That is correct. But you did live in San Francisco, right? I did. I, I grew up in the Bay Area. I knew uh, there was a California connection because... <laughs> You know, it, it. I don't know how you're doing, but I'm. I'm so lost. Like everything that's happening, I'm kind of like. I feel like I'm in a daze, coming out of it. But I. I need a nap, you know, and <laughs> really good food and a hard yeah. drink. How How are you doing? Are, are you uh, coming back? Yeah, you know, it was. Uh, I think, honestly, like getting off of Instagram, it becomes. Um, uh, media saturation, sensory saturation. And it, it reminds me of, because I collage and, I, and I've been going through a whole bunch of different old life magazines and stuff like that. And I happen across a picture, I think it was in an, an old Esquire magazine, maybe. Maybe it's probably life because Esquire doesn't make sense. Anywho, um, and it's a picture of the famine in Ethiopia. And at that time, seeing malnourished babies distended bellies, you know, skeletal, it was just shocking and graphic. And it still is today, but it's not something like we haven't seen before, right? Mm -hmm. So your mind is almost prepped and it's not shocked by it. And I don't want to have that same feeling with what's going on. Um, I think it's, I think for me, like the only difference is that that happened that, you know, that's going on in Africa. And so like, I'm not African in the sense of like, there's a, a, I have a direct connection to it, you know, in terms of like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so this is more visceral and I can relate to it. And so I don't want to just be like numb to that or to ingest all of that anger and go like, okay, what do I do with that? Because it can paralyze you, I think. Oh, and it happens. It sets in so quick, right? The numbness, just like, okay. <laughs> and I mean, you see like two videos of like, of like someone getting their head cracked, like police beating somebody else, and then seeing some discourse, you know, online, and you're just like, I, I got to get out of this. Totally. And so this is the second time we connect. We tried doing this. My computer wasn't working, and then I we did it on Instagram. The audio was bad, and it, honestly, it was like such a, uh, an indication of what's happening, you know, like in the world right now. It's just not yeah. working, but we're working really hard to to fix it. So here we are, and and exactly. it's better. Um, yeah, but I hear what you're saying about the discourse, and it's so funny. And and I want to talk about art, which is why we're here. But sure. we have to talk about the context in which we're having this conversation. Uh, it people are so quick to infight. You know, when, when someone posts something and in and, and, and solidarity for something like, oh, you, you're alienating this group or you're not doing it right. And it's like, oh, we're, we're tripping on that trap. We're, we're triggering this like self-policing that is not positive. You know, it, it's very. Yeah. I had that today, actually. I had. I had posted something that said. Basically along the lines of like, look, the history of the police within the United States is based on slavery and it's based on the slave catchers. That's a historical fact. It's been proven that, it, that police, policing in general in the world, but specifically the United States, has been used to uh, control the poor working class. And that has shifted over time, but it has you know, definitely affected the black and brown community. That's not like up for negotiation, it just is. And so I put, look, if you don't agree, feel free to unfollow me now. And I got a response from one of my followers, uh, who's obviously not a follower anymore, um, <laughs> who's an artist, but like, you know, a 20 year veteran of the military and of the police force and took personal offense to that. And it was kind of like, if you take personal offense to this, then I'm touching a nerve with you personally. If you saw it for the larger context of what I'm saying and, and, and going, look, the institution which you work for which you might be doing good work is rotten. It would be no different than me coming around and saying, Hey, lovely house. I love your decor. I love your house parties. You always feed me. You're always nice to my kids, but your foundation 
is crumbling due to termites. You can ignore what I'm saying, but it does not negate the fact that that's what it is. And I see people kind of like coming at odds with that. And it's like, look, check your personal thing. Talk about the larger context of what's going on. Like it's, I'm not attacking you. And if you feel like you're being attacked on both sides, then it's like, hey man, maybe you need to, here's ego. Let's put that aside and go, what are you, what are you fighting for? You know, you can't be a freedom fighter all the time yeah. and then not want a promised land. Oof, that that's, that's like strong. War, right. right? It means you just like war and destruction. Right. And that's okay. There are people that have done that historically, but they've also died on the battlefield. Right. right? Those, those people don't live. I think it's also really interesting. You touch on a point that before this kind of came to a boil, mm-hmm. you know, when you post something about gay rights, uh, Black Lives right. Matter, we're always kind of preaching to the choir, right? Because, yeah. you know, right. my followers ha- already have a disposition, your followers have a disposition. So the right. fact that you're having these encounters with people who are kind of like not the choir is so powerful within itself, yeah. right? That is. Because that's the only way we're going to have, we're going to progress this conversation. And it's so interesting to see. Uh, this mobilization of people because that's what it is. They're not preaching to the choir. They're mobilizing that choir and just going all at it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, I just really hope it doesn't stop. I hope it's safe, but I hope it doesn't stop because it's so easy in America to kind of just go to the next thing. Like we did with the pandemic, right? Pandemic. Yeah. What? What's that? Now we yeah. have to fight for this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. Crazy. And it's scary because it's, um, you know, I was in between. We, so we have our initial, uh, Skype, uh, our, our Instagram kind of interview. And then we were supposed to have one yesterday. And so in between that time, you know, I spoke with my mom. And so my mom's in her seventies. Uh, you know, she protested the Vietnam war down, down in, down in, in, you know, the city. So she's from, you know, she's Puerto Rican from the city, um, uh, from, from Red Hook. So, you know, none of this is new to her. None of the things that people are talking about, um, is new. This is all very kind of like same slogans. Even some of the same people that were giving the speeches are alive today. They're just professors and stuff like that. Um, but I think the, the, what was interesting was that I think now it's like, we just have so much distraction. Like, you know, New York just lifted the whole ban on whatever. And I just drove to get groceries right before this interview. And I just realized how crowded the roads are. Like I live in the suburbs, like way out in the middle of nowhere. And the roads are instantly packed. And then I look at the mall and it's packed. And I look at like all these like crappy chain suburb food places. And they're like, oh, we'll have, you can eat outside. You know, like these like makeshift picnic tables. And I'm going, hey folks, we still have to wear masks. Like, the COVID thing, that hasn't gone away. You know what I mean? Like, and and we still are so quick to distract ourselves. We want to go back. And I'm like, that door is closed. You know what I mean? Like, we're we're not going back to that. We can't go back to that. You shouldn't want to go back to that. Um, And she said what was, the reason I bring my mom up, because she said, the thing that artists, the duty of artists, writers, painters, musicians, whatever, is that we're supposed to document the times, right? So we are bearing witness to what's going on so that we can look back and say, oh, that's that's what happened. That's what was created. That was the spirit of what was going on because it's not going to be in our textbooks. You and I both know that with our different, you know, varied cultural histories and go, how much of your Latinx or your Mexican heritage did you learn in textbooks in the United States. It was just like, oh, hey, La Raza, there was some <laughs> thing down in California, people were fighting, no and then, games. exactly, right? And then they just went, hey, let's let's keep it moving, and oh yeah, I think Mexico owned California, ha ha ha, and then that was it. Yeah. Like, that's not even, it might be two test questions on your AP, you know, US history test. And it's the same, you know, with any other history. But what remains though, are those murals, you know, of Diego Rivera in the mission. You know, what remains is, you know, the artwork, the posters, the music, the movies, 
you know, all of that stuff is there. And now more than ever, we have access to access to that. You know, we have, uh, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Well, I'm wondering, right. Just because it's in speaking with other creatives, right. I know mm -hmm. that sometimes people, and, and again, this is before the revolution, let's call it. Um, yeah, yeah. Artists were so afraid to be of to, to have a certain staple of, of a political view because then mm -hmm. artists don't make money if people don't endorse them, right? Getting getting an influencer type uh, type of endorsement from a from a label or something. Uh, exactly, exactly. Or like you know, like for instance, I did a um, I had a spot on a rum commercial with my art because mm -hmm. my art was mm -hmm. so. You know, it, it was sexy, it was cool, but it mm -hmm. wasn't like, it wasn't right. any, it didn't have an agenda other than look how beautiful the world is, right? Which is perfectly right. fine. Right. But like you're saying, at some point, something kind of clicks and you're like, oh man, I got to say something. Right. And, I'm wor and I'm just wondering how artists are going to deal with this. Because in the past, anytime you said anything, it kind of branded you, right? Oh, that's the yeah. angry black artist. Oh, that's the Chicano, you know, right. militant. Right. Um, so that's really interesting, you know, uh, I, I, yeah. I hope people can rise above that. Well, actually, you know, what's really interesting too, and, and mm. this is just me talking out yeah. loud. No, no, this is interesting. I'm really fascinated and kind of pleased by the commonplace use of the, of the phrase white supremacy now, mm. because I think before it was only used with extreme cases of like KKK or, or major injustices, but it's right. not only that. It's the fact right. that I can't see anybody that looks like me in a magazine. It's the fact that right. there's only one black character in certain right. movies when it's not cool, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, what do you think about that? I, I, so, like we, when we talked about before about my, my history and stuff, and, and I was telling you, you know, um, in, in the, lost, the Lost Tapes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that I was uh, I was in the military and I was an intelligence officer for for a little bit, and my boss, who I didn't particularly like, but was right about a lot of things, um, said words have meaning, and it and, and our job with intelligence was to use the appropriate words for the appropriate audience, and that if you don't use the right word, right, a, a pot is not the same thing as a skillet as a wok as a cauldron. Those are all different things, right? You can boil water in all of them, but your applications and what you're going to cook with and all that stuff varies. And so I think, you know, naming conventions and ascribing the appropriate um, descriptor to things and saying, no, 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 no. What you're using is a very watered down word. The real term that you need to ascribe to what you're doing is white supremacy. It is that it is that toxic. It is that poisonous. It isn't like, oh, hey, you know, wait, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm bigot adjacent. No, no, no. You're a white supremacist. Yeah. And and, and I think it it jars people. Yeah. It jars people as much as someone using a racial epithet towards you. Right. Well, it's a trigger, right? Which is good marketing, really. You know, you have to trigger the emotions. You got to wake people up and say, hey, man, what you're doing is not. You know, it's it's that jab to the face not an uppercut and it's not a cross but it's definitely a jab to say whatever you're doing that's not going to work you need to reassess what's going on and i think right now because we're what's this the, the first week of it you know really this is just a jab we got a couple of rounds we got eight rounds 12 rounds or whatever it is in boxing or some sport i don't follow but <laughs> you know, like it, it, it this is going to take a long time and and I think that is the proof, right, is to see if people are going to weather that storm. Well, I hope we have the attention span for it. You know, as Americans, we're so, you know, what, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think we're just happy that we did, you know, oh, wow, is this, is this not, is it over yet? You know, when's the next? I mean, we binge watch television shows that at least I know in your, my, you know, childhood, it was unfathomable. It's like you wait until the next week until the show comes out. And if that episode sucks, you wait until the next week and hope that one's better. Like, you don't get to binge watch anything. You yeah. got to watch it when it comes out. And I think that's the danger of this is that 
as artists, like you were saying before, with your art and it being, you know, used in a commercial application, I worry that, and I know I've already started to see a lot of followers that would never have ordinarily followed me, that I know are only following me because of white guilt, because they're like nine times out of ten white. Well, let me ask you about that. We spoke about it in the la in the last tape. I've yeah. I've spoken to other artists uh, who are black, and they're like, I don't know how I feel about this. And, and I'll give you my response like I did before, and, and then you can tell me what you think. They're like, you know, I, I don't know how I feel about all this attention all of a sudden when I've been trying to get their attention for years. And my, yeah. my, my gut response was like, take it. Take it. Yeah. Because the momentum that is happening now was paid at a very hefty price. Mm -hmm. You know? What, what is your take? I would say I agree with that in part. Um, there's an artist that someone had, uh, I guess, introduced me to is, is the right term. And he's black. And he said, you know, look, I remember receiving the same the same type of buzz, uh, um, you know, when Trayvon Martin, you know, and that issue came up. And I remember seeing, you know, all the buzz with Eric Gardner. And it was the same thing. All of a sudden, my followership went up. It was predominantly white. And nobody bought anything. And it's like, I don't care if you follow me. And I say the same thing. I really don't care. I did not join Instagram for followers. I don't have that many. I'm not going to get a whole bunch. And, and, and a lot of the artists that I really like, honestly, like, I don't think they would have survived on Instagram in this day and time. They just wouldn't. Yeah. Um, but I do agree with what you're saying. is like, take that energy in the sense of like, I'm going to put you, I'm going to increase the speed of the treadmill. If you think, you know, uh, uh, and I'll, you know, like with the military, it's like, okay, we're going to go on a three mile run at a seven minute mile pace. This is baseline. Like this, if this is as fast as you can go, you're not going to make it through this program. And that is kind of how I am treating that attention. If you think that your activism is just following a black person and then not even commenting, not even bother to comment on any of the art that I'm doing. You're just following because that's usually what happens. You just get random followers and you don't even bother to ask, can I buy some art? How can I contribute? If you're not putting money or opportunities in front of me. I'd rather you leave because you're no different than being a bandwagon fan for any sporting team because they're winning. You don't really care. You're not really interested. You just want to be on the in crowd. Who needs that? Yeah. It's, I've got like five friends. I can, you know, <laughs> my, really, like yeah. five hard friends where I know, hey man, I'm really, really in trouble. I need you to get the word out to my mom or my brother, or I need a thousand dollars. And I think with a little convincing, I would get it. So I don't need a thousand followers or 10,000 followers. There's no way I would know you. It's nice. It feels the ego. Yeah. It does create opportunities, right? Because people, other companies are going to reach out to you. And that feels good, but not for this. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I get that. I mean, honestly, I've always felt like, uh, and, and yeah, and, it's, and I think it's a different context, but I've always thought, yeah, you infiltrate and then you, you take from within, right? And then, right. And then you, op you, hold, you open the door, you hold the door and people come in. Um, but yes, it's, and, and you know, because we're American and we're like, we're, we're hustling, 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 we're supposed right. to hustle. Right. I, I always forget to factor in the emotional aspect, you know, just like oh, the, the heaviness of it all, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's intense. It's intense. But it is. you're an artist. You collage. When yeah, I, I saw your work, I was like, oh, my God, uh, this guy shares DNA with me. Like, yeah. can yeah. you tell me about your collage practice? How did that start? Sure. So, you know, it, it essentially, you know, was born out of photography. You know, I, I, I had learned photography after I got out of the military, um, you know, taking some courses locally uh, in uh, Troy, New York. And then I also went up to the um, Maine media up in Camden, Maine. Uh, they had some courses that I was able to take um, at a discount because I was a veteran. Nice. And a lot of my stuff was like film and film super, super expensive. Um, but you know, I plowed on with that. I had a little bit of change in my, my pocket. I was out of the military, newly married. Um, 
my wife at the time, she's, she's Japanese. So we stayed here for about a year after I got out and then we moved back to Japan. Wow. And I went there to kind of essentially work in a cafe and a restaurant. And our goal was to create kind of like a cafe together. Wow. You know, How cool. Then create a cafe and she was going to do kind of the, the storefront side. You know, she had gone to a university in Tokyo that's um, a famous fashion uh, university in uh, Shinjuku, uh, part of Tokyo. And so that was kind of the goal. Um, that did not work. I am not married. Um, <laughs> so I returned back to the United States kind of just broken, you know, dejected, you know, that feeling of coming out of a long term relationship that I think everyone can relate to. Sadly, but. You know, that's, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Um, but I still wanted to make art, but doing photography reminded me of being with her, being in Japan and it, it just, I couldn't. And so I, but what I did started to notice was like, I still loved fashion magazines. So my eye was still there and the, the, the yearning to make something, it was just, I couldn't bring myself to do the physical act. And photography, or collage rather, allowed me to take photographs in a sense. And a lot of my original stuff was just like a reconstruction of a photograph with some kind of painterly illustrative, you know, elements. It just allowed me to kind of make photos. And so they were all small. I mean, they were all like postcard size. Mm -hmm like uh like a you know the peel apart polaroids so i and it's again i'm glad we had the second like interview because i just went to the storage locker that i shared with my mom and i was looking for some some material and i found like all my old artwork and i was like oh man i gotta remember this when louise calls because it's like i had forgotten you know i'd forgotten oh that's what i was thinking about. what did it look like um, very fragmented. So it looked kind of mosaic-y. I would take like a, a picture, like a, um, like a, a subject, uh, always women, even now for the most part, I don't really collage with men. Um, I don't know why it's not that I don't find, you know, the, the male figure. So I just was like, yeah, I think you can say something sometimes more poetically with the female figure that you just sometimes with the male figure. And I think that's just how men are photographed, honestly. In fashion oh, for magazine. sure. Yeah. Um, and anyway, but it was a lot, it, you know, the subject was, you know, I'll give an example because I printed this out on, um, so this was just abstracted from a uh, scan. Wow. A, uh, and I printed it on like, like cheap, like packing paper. Oh, that's so cool. So, you know, and I'm going to take this and then put it on top of something else. But to just illustrate what I was saying, I would just take this part of the image and, and I wouldn't use anything else. And then around it, I would just put like all these little patterns and nice. kind of this thing. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, oh, that's where my mind was in terms of like thinking about relationship and women and love. And, and I was like trying to piece myself back together, if that makes sense. Of course, yeah. But at the time, like, I'm not thinking about any of that. I just want to just, like, forget about pain, but then also, like, do something that, like, brings me joy. Totally. Um, With collaging, you know, I think uh, stream of conscious is such a big part of it, you know? Uh, yeah. Because usually you don't know what you're going to find in your magazines. You're kind of clipping, right? Your yeah. work in particular, when I saw it, I saw so many connections to history, so much connections to a certain grace um, that I think you're talking about as far as the, the female figure and not in a, in a kind of a, a sexualized way, quite the opposite in a very, like I said, graceful way. Um, mm -hmm. where do you think that comes from? You, you, you were saying that it's kind of like maybe the way you see women, yeah. but, but there's a historical connection there. What do you think you're, you're subconsciously trying to say? Sure. So in respect to the female subject, I'm, I'm pretty cognizant of as much as I can to try to remove the male gaze. Mm -hmm. That's obviously not possible just for the fact of me being a man. Right. Um, and you know, and, and that's just, that's just not going to change. Um, but 
all of my photography teachers and most of my art teachers that I connected with and the way they were able to translate art to me, they were all women. And so the way, at least for me, women taught was more of a cooperative thing and their language was very different. So when I was taking portrait photography um, uh, courses and then learning how to go do that and then also doing documentary portrait photography, the language that was always used was not, can I take your picture? It was always discussion first. And then could you help me with something? Can you help me with this project? Wow. I was wondering if you could help me make this. It was very different because it's giving the power to the person and the involvement. And they're going, oh, well, what do you need? Why do you need my help? And what are you making? And then it's still more discussion. And then the, the end product is really, it's great. And that's what you're aiming for, but it's the discussion and, and that kind of interaction. So that goes definitely into my, my collage. That's really uh, fascinating because that this is post military, correct? Yeah. So you, yeah. you have these two things to compare and contrast. I was not the same dude, <laughs> the, you know, and, 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 and I was not the same guy, not because it wasn't me on the inside. It was just, that wasn't the currency of the land or what I thought the currency mm. needed to be, you know? And I think sometimes we adapt to a surrounding that can be unhealthy. God, well, that's fascinating that you're saying that because in the current context, you know, yeah. the, the, the it's changing, the words are changing. And, yeah. you know, I think be right before this, even up to a few months, you know, we're, we're in this millennial culture and, and yeah. as, there's a lot to criticize, but there's a lot also that, that, that really is coming into play in a really positive way. Like the yeah. idea of the future is feminine, right? Like, right. This is right. how you have these conversations, just like you're saying now. Yeah. That used to be kind of like a hashtag slash joke. And now people are going, yeah, maybe we don't need a lot of dudes in charge of stuff. Maybe, you know, maybe let's not do that because that's def you're definitely not doing the right thing. That's wild. I love that you said that. Um, now, I want to know, as you perceive the world, do you perceive it more with the lens of military that was mm -hmm. part of your identity or as the part of artists that's now part of your identity more so? You know, again, so I've had time to think about that question. Um, I don't, I think it's just kind of just as me. I think the military was just a part of my life that makes me who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember, you know, the first day I went to the, um, the Naval Academy for my university, which is in a typical, you know, university, you're wearing uniforms and marching and running around and all that nonsense. Um, but the first thing they told us was that, and I never, I, I remember this guy's name, and uh, I won't use it now because I don't want to like shit him, but uh, okay. he's a tall, skinny dude. And he said, look, guys, you're going to see, we were like like freshmen in this training stuff. And he was a junior. And he said, you're going to see examples of good leadership and you're going to see examples of bad leadership. And you have an opportunity to learn from both. So when I look back at my time in the military and I go, okay, there's a lot of negative stuff. There was a lot of positive things and the negative stuff. It's like, this is what I don't want to be. This is where I, what I don't want to do. And the positive stuff that's really easy to bring. That's really easy to bring in, you know, my traveling around the world because of my work and interacting with people and trying to learn foreign languages and, and, and just learning little catchphrases and just little stuff, you know, all the Anthony Bourdain esque mm -hmm. things we're talking about eating food over fire. That's all true. When I heard that, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happens when you travel around the world. Um, but it, it's, I take all of that, right? You know, learning is built upon learning. So we don't think like we're eight. Hopefully we take that, that wonderment and that excitement and that, and that, um, that softness, you know, hopefully, you know, if you had a good childhood, but that innocence to accept the difference that exists because you you are that to somebody else right yeah so I um i don't know i you know I, 
it's definitely not as a military member, but I do see, I'll say this, because I've been steeped in government bureaucracy, when I hear those lines being fed back to me, I go, oh, I know where you're coming from with this, right? I understand the lingo, right? So if we were talking about, let's say, a religious experience or a new diet or you started yoga I'm, and I'm going, oh, and I'm giving you all the excuses why. And you're going, hey, man, I get it. That's the, those are the excuses I had. So you can either say, you either go, oh, man, you just got to do, do, do. And you go, well, that's not how you came to that understanding, right? You didn't come to it the same way with someone beating over your head. You came to it with acceptance and, and understanding. And I was listening to uh, an excerpt from James Baldwin where he said, not everything that can be, not everything that can be faced or not everything that is faced can be changed. But that doesn't mean that, you know, we don't, I forgot the rest of the line, but the, it was essentially saying like, but that doesn't mean we don't face anything. Like if you don't face it, then it definitely can't be changed. Right. Yeah. And I, it's like, you got to face that. There's going to be a lot of, this isn't going to be solved in your or my lifetime. It's not happening. They get solved in our parents' lifetime or our grandparents. It's just, that's not the reality. That's not how human minds work. That's not how societies change. I mean, look how long it took, let's say, the fall of, of communism. Well, I think it's really interesting because uh, it's such an American experience, right? When, when you go to Europe, when you go to London and you speak to a black person, their mm -hmm. demeanor is completely different. When you go to Mexico and you speak to a Mexican person, their demeanor is completely different. When you go to Thailand and you meet a person from Thailand, that you know, there's a stereotype in America of the you know meek Asian or whatever. No, these people are are, are full human beings and they're self possessed. They've never been colonized, you know. So it's like it's this coding that we have as Americans. And mm -hmm. you're right; it's going to take a very long time to decode this. Um, but I, I'm just I'm just thinking out loud. I'm wondering. You know, it's in everything. It's in our TV. It's in the way, you know, our food is served yeah. to us. It's, it's, it's our weird. Food. It's our, it's, it's, it's how food is marketed to us. You know, it, it's, it's, it's who we choose to have in the marketing to, to display or be these examples of good and bad and right and wrong. And there are these but, parallel worlds that I don't think we're willing to unify. You know, like I, I have a window that goes that looks over to some condos, mm -hmm. and on on one of those days where everything was going upside down, it was a nice it was a nice day. And I look yeah. out the window, and there's people sunbathing, and I'm like, and it's, it's <laughs> one of those things where you go six months ago, let's say a year ago. When, when Syria was getting bombed into the Stone Age, was anybody protesting in the United States? Did anybody care? You know, last summer, were people, you know, July is coming up. Were, did people care about a barbecue or did they care about all the refugees that were, you know, it's like, that's always going to be there. I think that's human. I think it's human for us to, and it's unfathomable to see that massive amount of suffering you know, they've, they've had studies where they've talked. If someone says, oh, a thousand people died and such and such, most people can't fathom what a thousand looks totally. like. A thousand pennies, a thousand m and m It doesn't matter what it is. We can't. So then when you're talking about human life and you're going, a thousand people do not exist and, and violently and immediately. But if you say two people got shot and killed two blocks away from your house, a mother and a child, something that humanizes that makes it like, oh, wait, that, that could be me. Or that could be me and my brother or me and my husband or me and my mom or whatever. It, it, that's human. We just, we distance ourselves from yeah. that pain. Absolutely. Um, Although I, mu I must say something must be said about not showing, uh, for the most part, I mean, I, and I don't watch much TV, so I can't, I can't say this definitely, but I just, you know, you don't see the images of like all of the people from COVID, right? Like who, who passed? You don't. You don't. You don't. And I think that's purposeful. Totally. I, I think that's. I think that would. If we remember what happened after nine eleven, so I don't know where you were, but nine eleven, I was. It's like a, I was in Virginia. I graduated. I was two years. No, 
a year out of the Naval Academy. I was in Virginia. Someone said, hey, there's a plane that flew in. Everyone thought it was uh, like a little small plane because there had been a plane about a week ago or two weeks prior that had flown into a building somewhere in like Oklahoma or Texas. You know, someone had been flying a plane low level and flew into a building. So that's what everyone thought. Obviously, that wasn't the case. And they showed most most news stations showed, you know, after the buildings, the towers had fell, the smoldering wreckage, right? The spire that was sticking out and all that sort of the ongoing efforts and the flag. And people called in to the, the news stations and said, take that off. Why can't you resume regular programming? Why can't we go back to the way it was? And it's like, well, what do you say to all those families that lost their loved ones? What do you say to all these people that were soon to lose their lives, right? All the, the, the first responders and stuff. What do you say to those people? You gotta watch your soaps. You have to watch the prices, right? Because you can't see that. And I think there's this, there's that kind of disconnect of like, you know, and it's and it's why it has to be shown. It's why you gotta bring your phone if you do it. It's why you gotta make your art if you don't feel safe to going to the protest. Because people have to see it. They have to see this is how this is processed through the mind. Well, you, know. you bring up, yeah, the, the, the idea of, of visuals and, yeah. and history, right? With 9-11, I, I, had, I was in New York when it happened, and I postponed going to the Memorial Museum. Yeah. Two years ago, a teacher was visiting who was staying with me. She wanted to go. I, mm-hmm. I went with her, and I really thought I was in for, you know, to, to right. relive it, to, to see the visuals. And I, part of me wanted to experience this, right? It needed to be this cathartic experience. And I was so surprised that I, you know, I didn't see the people jumping from the building. I didn't yeah. see the man on fire. And yeah. I feel like that happened. That needs to be shown. Like, you erase that, you erase that man's legacy. You know, it's kind of yeah. erasing the man in Tenement Square. Going, yeah. go, you know what I mean? Like, that happened. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm yeah. learning something from watching this. Yeah, yeah. It's nuts. <laughs> yeah. It is. And I think I think that's where art, that's where collage, definitely personally, bridges the gap, right? And I don't think every single piece that you have to make, you know, needs to be this impact statement. Like you said, there's a commercial practice and a personal practice. Everyone's got to eat. I think the the question is, am I being exploited, right? I think the sellout isn't, did you work for corporate? It's like. Did you sell out on your principles in in order, you know, to to get that dollar? You know, I don't know if you listen to hip hop, but like there's the group uh, Run the Jewels, RTJ. Not familiar. So uh, uh, the the two guys, it's like a big black guy named Killer Mike, who's a hip hop artist, but then he's also a big time, you know, advocate, um, you know, social advocate and speaker and and so forth. And then his partners, this white dude named ELP. Um, and they kind of, their whole thing is like, they're kind of like two banditos and, and kind of like a starchy and hutch type thing. And, and that's kind of the thing that they do for these albums, you know, in their combined practice. One of that on their newest album, they have this line uh, where essentially they're saying, look, you know, you're, you want the new sh- you want this, you know, you grew up poor, now you're rich, or you you you're, you're, you got all these followers, and now you got all this money, but look at those slave masters flexing on your dollar. Mm. And it's like, it's like, hey, remember where you are. Remember who holds the cards. That if you think because you have all this money, because you have all of this, it's a box within a box, right? So Zach De La Rocha in, uh, in Rage Against the Machine, he goes, I don't want the G rides. I want the machines that are making them, you know, because if you're purchasing it, if you're buying it, you're a customer. If you're the one who owns the football team, right, you're the person that's deciding what the uniform is, how people can protest, right, what advertisements are going to be in your stadium. If you're a football player, that's great. It's a wonderful accomplishment. You're making millions of dollars, but you didn't, you didn't set your paycheck. And you don't decide when you can play and when you can't play. And you didn't decide your contract. So it's just one of those things where it's like artists, that's kind of, right, the burden to bear. It's like, 
we want to say truth. We want to speak truth to power within our art. But at the same time, these materials aren't free. You know, no one's gifting you paint or paper or glue sticks. No one's doing that stuff. Yeah, and I think the only way that's going to happen is if artists take the reign and define their success in their own terms, you know? Stop seeking that Whitney show. Stop seeking... Stop paying $25 to go to MoMA, (laughs) you know? (laughs) It's true. I mean, it's it's funny that you say because I almost paid... I, you know, not that my artwork was good, you know, good at the time, but there was an open call for a magazine and, you know... With most of them, it's like, oh, you want to drop three images? You got to do the images plus the bio plus thirty five dollars, and then, then you get like, I don't know, an automated email back like a month later saying, hey, thanks for playing. We put your thirty five dollars to good use. And you go, well, how many other dupes are doing this? And I almost did it again this time. And then I just said, why do you care, man? Like you're. I told people I was like, oh, I'm gonna have a Skype interview on this podcast you know, tomorrow. And they're like, dude, that's amazing. And I was like, that is amazing because two years ago, nobody cared about what I was doing. Nobody was talking to me and saying, Hey, what do you think about when you make art? I didn't know this person. I didn't see his art. I didn't see his larger practice. That is, you know, part of my French fucking awesome. Is that success? Um, There's an artist. He's from, it's not Ghana. It'll come back to me. His name is uh, El Mosquito. Yeah. Uh, he's like, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the African countries that used to be a Portuguese colony. Mm. So he does a lot of performance, uh, performance art. He does a lot of collaborative art. So a lot of his art is, um, you know, I'll write a script for a movie, but you'll act it out type thing. Or I need to work with another artist in order for this to, cool. to come um, and he talks about success and one of his, and I'll send you the interview after this. I would appreciate that. I'll link that. Definitely like dig it. And he talks about success being like understanding your purpose, right? And, and, and being given, and I'm paraphrasing, like the latitude, the freedom to then execute on that purpose, Right. And he equates it to, he goes, what I love seeing is like when, when a footballer scores a goal, right? All that ball passing around, all that stuff. And right when they score a goal, that's all the hard work. That's all the stuff. They're being able to execute that purpose and reaping the rewards. No one's handing them money right there. Of course, they're getting paid. But it's as artists, that is what we want to do, right? The ability to do our art, to show it to people, to have the discourse, for some people to hate it, to love it, you would love them to love it. But even if they hate it, it creates discussion. And then to be able to do it again freely without, you know, that encumbrance of, of, of all the other things that mill around in our day. Um, that's amazing. That's kind of, yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah. amazing. And the amazing part is also that like attracts like, right? Like I didn't know you, but I connected to something in your work. And you're mm-hmm. saying this, and that's pretty much my motto, right? <laughs> any 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 opportunity that I've ever had is an opportunity that I've made for myself, right? I, I learned real quick that for whatever reasons, the boat's not coming for you. So you better know how to, you better know how to swim. So <laughs> I really don't know how to swim, but I learned how to try it, right? So yeah, yeah. I, and I love that you're saying, you know, getting into a magazine, and and, and as soon as you said, I'm like, make a make a zine. I'll buy it. You know what I mean? Like you and that. Exactly, and that's yep. a success because you're gonna sell it to people who are willing to support you for X amount of dollars, and then you know their faces. You know they're gonna be there the next time you have another zine, and it's yep. these small, incremental successes that yep. kind of just create this whole experience of like, oh, it's worth it, right? Right. And so, the parallel to what you were starting off this converse, you know, this interview with in terms of this movement, it's like that's how you build community. Right, it's it's incremental steps. It's going to take a while. The artist that you are today was definitely not the artist you were, t- you know, ten years ago. You know, and you thought, oh man, my art is fucking awesome. And it's like it probably was, but is your art better now? Is it more nuanced? You know, are you? Is it? Does it have more intention? 
You know, are you able to then take your art and move it from something that's self-serving to then, well, let me see if there's other artists. What do they have to say? Do they vibe with me? Maybe they don't. Why don't they? Um, yeah, that's something that I was not thinking about when I first started collage that I started thinking about mm, maybe three or four years ago, if I'm honest, because it, I started making them easier, right? So the idea that was in my head was starting to appear easier. So then that was not the challenge. You know, the, the manipulation of the materials was like, okay, no, I know where all these guys are getting their stuff. Old Vintage Life magazines, da 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 yeah. where to go. Uh, I know there's a ton of estate sales. Nobody <laughs> likes these magazines. You can buy them for like a box of them for like $50, or you can go on eBay and pay $50 for one. So like that wasn't the exciting part anymore, right? So the exciting part was like, you know how to do this. So what are you, what are you going to say? And, and to quote like another artist that has impacted me in terms of thought and, and, and you said a historical you know, uh, significance was, was uh, Kerry James Marshall, um, who we talked about last time. Um, that was essentially like, you know, I went to a museum in my youth, you see all these beautiful European paintings, but in none of these paintings uh, is the black face prominent, right? It is not center subject. It is always, you know, to the periphery. So I don't need to give voice to, to the white subject. There are plenty of people that are going to do that. As a black artist, what am I saying? What am I doing? What is my intention with my work? And I was slowly coming to that when I was going through the different magazines that I love. And I really love these magazines. Um, but I wasn't seeing enough black faces. Or when I did see black faces in some of the magazines, they were never close-up pictures. Right, so the, the collage, the image that I want, they would have like four or five different models. One would be black, and she would never get a close-up. You would never see the big full page spread. I mean, almost never. And I was like, what is going on? I can't p keep paying one to see faces that don't look like me. What's the why am I giving why am I paying twenty five dollars for a magazine to not see anything that looks like me? I'm only laughing because that's why I don't go to the movies anymore. I refuse to go to the oh, movies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you go to the movies and everyone's like, oh, that's really, really wonderful. And you go, out of all the big time movies, last year's Oscars, where were there any black characters? And a lot of those movies, you could have put anybody. You could have put someone Latino. You could have put someone Asian. You could have put someone Indian, Sri Lankan. It did not matter. It was like, if your script is good and the movie director is that good and you can find an actor in a different hue, then your movie should work. Unless it's a period piece, you know, you know, English countryside Somerset. Well, of course, there's not. <laughs> well, I mean, Hamilton worked, right? So <laughs> things we go, is this art or is this commercial, right? And, and, I, and then what I don't like, and, I, and, I, and the, I know the movie was powerful to a lot of people, but for me, you know, seeing Black Panther, I was just like, that's crumbs. Like, I'm glad all those actors got paid. It was an all-black movie that never existed when I was a kid, for sure. But we don't own Marvel, and we don't own any of those production studios. And I dare say Marvel, or at least one of the major executives, is a, is a major contrib you know, contributor to the Trump campaign. So it's one of those things where you go, Okay, so that's our one movie. We get, that's what we get, Black Panther, that's it. And then no more, right? We're not getting any more of those movies? Oh, okay. So it's like... This makes me think of a conversation that I was having with myself. And I, don't, and I can speak you forever, so I, I have to be quick about this. Um, you know, after Obama, everyone was like, well, do we still need, like, a black museum? Do we still need a Latino museum? And right. part of me was like, Maybe not, right? Because then you're, you're self-segregating and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But then I, I was like, but no, we need to have a contingency that goes, has a chair at the table because we kind of just assume and give our power thinking that someone's going to think of us. You know, someone's going to, oh, maybe we should make a black movie or maybe we should make a Latino superhero. I will, I will say this uh, and I'll give, you, I'll give you a little 
I'm, and I'm all, I promise I won't go on a, a major tangent. <laughs> go for it, go for it. <laughs> so when I was little, I would, I grew up in like partly San Francisco, partly uh, Oakland. And when I was little in preschool, I went to the Jewish community center. So I'm the only, you know, chocolate face in a sea of white faces. And, you know, we did Shabbat Shalom and all that stuff. And I thought, well, I'm Jewish like everybody else. And of course I'm not. But what I loved about that experience, and then further on as I went to high school and all that stuff, um, the high school that I went to uh, in the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco was predominantly Jewish. So all of those Jewish holidays and, 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 uh, and holy days were off. Like school was basically vacated. Everyone was at temple. There is a Holocaust museum in many countries, not just in Europe, but also in the United States. And they have remembrances and movies all the time because they know, right? And this is, you know, those of the Jewish faith and the, and, and, and the Jewish race. They know if they stop doing that, people will do that again. That people will forget because it's happened time and time. You know, it's happened what, however many years prior to the Holocaust, you know, it, you know, in Spain, you know, or in Germany. And it's like, you have to make people remember. You have to have those museums because people forget. I mean, look how long it took people to forget about the Civil War. And then you have, and that's the whole purpose of all those statues, right? Of the, the sons or the daughters of the revolution um, was that let's put all these Confederate soldiers up in the South because they wanted everyone to remember the indignity of losing the Civil War that they started based upon the enslavement of people. But they continue to press it. And it's like, if you, you know, if you don't speak up, if you don't say, yes, I am a Latino artist, I am a black artist. Um, again, Carrie James Marshall says, you know, uh, um, he quotes, uh, I believe it's W.E.B. Du Bois, who, I forgot, it's like, it's like, it's not letters to a young artist, that's somebody else, but he has this, this essay where an artist basically asks him, you know, has, a, has a, is having a conversation with him and he's saying, you know, I don't want to be labeled as a black artist. I want to be labeled as an artist. And what Kerry James Marshall says about W.E.B. Du Bois is that he's saying to be labeled an artist means that you want to be seen really as a white artist. You don't want to have to explain your other in your artistry. Because Latino artists and black artists, we paint all types of different stuff. And Asian artists paint all types of different stuff and draw all types of different stuff. It doesn't have to be, like you said, the obvious, you know, La Raza or like, you know, Black Panthers or I got an Afro. You could be painting abstracts, you know, and people are like, I didn't know he was whatever. But it's like the decision to remove, to extract that which is inherent in you and the people that came before you allowed you to be literally in the, in, in, in the place that you're living right now, to me, it's kind of like you're trying to quiet that, that inner witness, right? Mm. That person that busted their ass for you to be there and you would never have met them because that's how many generations apart you are. That's, yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, completely, completely. I mean, honestly, I, for the longest, I thought my success was was my greatest protest, right? Right, me too, a hundred percent. But then you realize that it's not enough. <laughs> you know, it would be like if a bear started talking to you, and then he goes to the other bears, "Hey, I think I'm in," and they're going, "You're still a talking bear. You're not one of us. Like you gotta." That's great. Good for you, my friend. But I think that's how some people see that kind of, you know, oh, you have a lot of money? Well, we have generational wealth. I mean, there's always something else. So you have to define if it's this, if it's if it's if it's if it's within if it's within here, you'll lose. You'll lose because that's their that's their game. You know, that's that's the people that are trying to keep you down. That's the game they'll make you play. Oh yeah. Right, but if you're trying to build community, you're trying to build those museums, you're trying to buy back the block, you're trying to teach people, you're going, man, if I, if I, you know, because I'm not getting paid for any of the art that I do, 
and I occasionally sell some prints to my friends and that type of stuff, which I'm trying to change and get a print shop going and it's a whole nother discussion. But my thing always is like, if I make it to any level of commercial sex success, if any person with brown or, or black skin or whoever, you know, any marginalized individual, between race or sexuality, if they have to jump through the same bullshit I have to jump through, then I have failed. Mm. You failed. Mm. If someone else that you look at and you go, that used to be me, if they have to eat the same shit that you have to eat, you failed at your job. You might as well just give up all your money and burn down your house. Because what are you doing? You know, I, I'm very passionate about that, so I don't want to go. Aaron, too- I love that. I love that. And you're, you're shaking me to my core in, like, all the right ways. Yeah, I, I feel that. I completely feel that. And it's so important to rehear it with that vigor that you have because it's yeah. so easy to just, like like we were talking about earlier, just want to be numb and push it away. I was I should be in Europe. Like, I was supposed to go on a month-long trip to Berlin, and I was going to visit my Cambridge. But, you know, COVID happened. Yeah. Was, oh, COVID, it's ruining my summer. You know, oh, I can't believe I can't do this. And then everyone watches a guy get executed with this knee on his neck, you know, with a with you know, police officer's knee on his neck. And you're going, well, that's happened before. But something about the COVID thing was like, okay, let's take a step back. People are dying. This, is, this isn't just the flu. And then you're seeing someone getting executed and people just watching it and going, you, you want to just go, it, it was almost like a horror movie where you go, run, like hit that cop, push him over, N- you know, your armchair quarterbacking it. Cause you, I don't know if people would do this, that, you know, I think people would normally do what people did. They filmed it and watched somebody die. Um, but it, it really kind of made me real reevaluate like, what are you, what are you talking about? What are you doing? Like, what are you making your art about? What are you thinking about? Like you said, you don't watch TV. What are you putting into your brain? You know, what images are we we constantly feeding our soul that reinforce that kind of um, passivity? You know, that kind of, you know, that kind of whatever that uh, brave new world, that that little little soma, that, that medicine they take to kind of numb and to chill. It's not drugs. It's not. It's like literally Netflix, Absolutely. Amazon Video, all of that stuff. Where's my sports? ESPN, cruise ships. They're all fine to do, but not if you're not if it's white noise and putting you into that kind of numb state. Then it's horrible stuff. Wow. Um, yeah. It, it really feels like this is our destiny. You know, this is this yeah, is our yeah. moment. Yeah, it is. And I think that's the thing. Like you said, it's like. If people are reaching out to you and they're following you, then you challenge them. You know, it's like someone that wants to go on a run with you or, hey, let's do yoga together. It's like, all right, man, like you've been talking all this stuff. You've been saying you want to you wanna do, all right, let's just see. Let's go, you know, we'll start it off easy. We'll start off with the jog. I don't want you to break down the first mile. We're going to push it about mile two and see if you still got that, right? You still got that same energy. <laughs> I love that, yeah. Because it's easy. It's, it's, it's one, a check for me, right? You know, as, as a brown person, as a black person to go, do I still have that? Am I going to am I, am I keep talking that talk? Or, or am I emboldened with all the people with their fists up and marching? Am I going to st- still be this fervent in November? Yeah. There it's go. June, but November is going to come around. And it's like, not only are you going to vote, but are you still going to be this fervent about, you know, coming with that same energy? Yeah. It's going to be tough because, HBO is probably gonna have a new lineup. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like true words have not been spoken. Yeah, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of hot stuff. So, Aaron, I am so happy I got to speak to you with Skype, with audio, yeah. with visual. Yeah. I am really excited to see what you do next, and I thank yeah. you for really shaking me to the core. Uh, and yes. it feels good. Thank you for acknowledging me. It, it gave me. Uh, it's given me, I, you know, the, the new work that, you know, I was showing you gave me kind of, hey, man, you know, what are we doing? This guy's interviewing you. Oh, like, you gotta, yeah. like, who are you? Like, what are you about? Don't just don't be tell this guy you want to do happy pictures. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. And I, and I love doing it, but it's like you can do more. So anyhow. 
perfect words to end. You can do more. Aaron, I appreciate it. You have a good one. Thank you, Luis. Bye.